before before I start talking about what I want to talk about, I was I was listening to at least the last part of what Antonio was saying. And I was a little bit intrigued. On, on, on the one hand, I was sort of happy with what Antonio described as sort of the future, because this is a PMI event of, of project management and, and, and certainly project manager, the new mindset that he, he sort of tried to uh, get true to, to you. At the same time, it was a little bit uh, sad in the sense that, oh my God, do we still have to uh, make these sort of calls to action to sort of upgrade your profession to, to what is needed in the world of today? And it, it, it reminds me a little, a little bit about a book I've been reading recently. I don't know if, if you heard about it. This is, this is the book. So it's a book by uh, Jim Highsmith, one of the HL pioneers, let's say. He was sort of uh, pioneering with HL IDs already before it was called HL. Um, he was a signatory of the HL Manifesto back in 2001. And, and what Antonio just said, and, and I want to reinforce that to, to all the, the beautiful people and project managers attending. So there's a couple of things he said in his book. And, and I'm, 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 as I was, I was preparing for my session and I was listening to Antonio, I, was, I looked up a couple of things. And one of the things he said that throughout his 60 years of IT and software development experience, he said that project managers were typically schooled teach educated in in serial waterfall processes and and what Antonio said about how the PMI uh introduces and promotes project management and 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 he, he got up the term of Prince two and so on that reminded me oh no my god is that still sort of almost actually happening and and then to to build a little segue to what I, I'm going to talk about um another thing that he said in in his in his book and I like that um, measures or measuring software development success has evolved from completion of the work, which Antonio referred to, completing the plan, following the plan, sticking to the plan, thinking that the plan has it all. And he said, has evolved from completion to customer value. And that is that is for me really important. And at some other point in his book, Jim Highsmith says that one of the biggest challenges, but it's 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 a uh, something that we have to go through. And that is what Antonio was referring to, I believe, is that sort of that mindset. And 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 Jim Highsmith, and I fully agree with that, said the, the mindset of a project manager should go from the plan and the tasks and the work to the people. So not completing the plan, but delivering value. And also not just tasks, but the people the human aspect of it. So I, I really, really like that message of Antonio and reminded me of what uh, Jim Highsmith talked about. So that, again, from my, my perspective as, as a Scrum person, that is a really important evolution. So uh, again, Anastasia and, and uh, all the people from the organization, thank you for having me. Um, I, I really look forward to connecting with people and we'll see uh, what happens. Yeah. So what I want to talk about today is, is what I call how to arm for value. Yeah? Um, because also what Jim Highsmith says, it's 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 the, the criterion for success: value, your ability to live well. So I want to talk about. It's part of me for a. Uh, it's part of my bigger story. Let's say that I've been talking about for the past couple of years already, which I call moving your scrum downfield, which could also read as your is between brackets as moving scrum downfield. But I'll, I'll, I'll share more about that. Uh, by the way, Anastasia, thank you. The way you pronounced my name was really beautiful. Um, it seems I have a difficult name for uh, people from abroad to actually pronounce it. But that was really, really great. I don't know if you have some background in Dutch also. I don't know, but it was really was great. <laughs> okay, you've been practicing. Okay, cool. So um, I, I live in Antwerp, that is in Belgium. Um, and, and my name, I live in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, because maybe as, as some people might know, we have three official languages in Belgium, uh, Dutch, French, and a little bit of German. Um, I live in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. And, uh, over here, my name would be pronounced as Günther Verheyen. So that's, uh, a challenge. And at least without some practicing, uh, like Anastasia did probably in, in impossible. 
but that's fine. But really, the funny thing is we've got these three official languages. Uh, so we've got this sort of uh, Bab Babylonic situation of uh, language confusion, uh, which we then try to overcome by adopting a fourth language. So sort of circumventing the problem. So that's why we all speak uh, in, a, in a professional environment. Often in Belgium, we, we, we write and, and often in meetings, we speak in English. It's just to avoid that. Oh, yeah, that's Dutch, French. Uh, let's, let's go for English. So uh, thank you, thank you very much for being here. Now this idea of moving Scrum or moving your Scrum downfield. Uh, a few years ago, it was the beginning of the Corona crisis. It was April 2020. Um, I don't know if you remember that situation. Uh, I don't know how many of you were in a lockdown situation. But here in Belgium, like in, in many places in Europe and across the world even, uh, the schools closed, businesses closed. You couldn't touch people. You couldn't approach people. You know, social distancing, distancing type of things and so on. So I was sitting at home in, in my home office here in, in Antwerp in Belgium and, and, and absorbing this. What is happening? What the hell uh, whatever, what is what is coming over us? Um, I'm I'm a slow thinker, so I always need time to absorb and process things. Uh, um, but at the same time, I was using the the ama amazing amount of spare time I, I suddenly had to try to to turn it into something positive too. And I wrote a paper, and that was called "Moving Your Scrum Downfield." Um, you can find it on on my on on my website if if you want. I will I will share a PDF version of the presentation with the organizers afterwards. And the, the, as you can see, there's a link in it. So I wrote the first version in April 2020. I just updated it just just a, a week ago, about a week ago. Uh, so you can download the latest version. And in my paper, I wanted to help people get across uh, their obsession often a negative obsession with the Scrum Guide. Because I, I know most of you are probably from the PMI, you've got the PM book uh, types of things. Prince2 has large uh, descriptions and, and instruction books and so on. Now Scrum has only a limited uh, instruction book. It's called the Scrum Guide. It's uh, 13, 14 pages. It was uh, updated after I wrote uh, this paper, but the update was ongoing as I was writing this. And, and in the end, um, I believe that latest edition of the Scrub Guide is, is what I would call sub-minimal. It used to be minimal, minimal but sufficient. It's sort of sub-minimal now. And I, and I was already by that time almost irritated at some point of time that people sort of having deep, 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 whatever deep would mean, debates over the Scrum Guide. What does it say? What words do they use? What phrasing do they use? Where they put? Where do they put a period? Where do they put a comma? A exclamation? Whatever that sort of totally baffles me. Why it almost sounds as if people are trying to learn Scrum from reading and discussing and debating and 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 fighting almost the Scrum guide. It's like as if you could learn a language by studying the dictionary. Imagine I would have the ambition to learn Ukrainian, because that would mean that in the future I could understand what, uh, what people like you talk about. The, the, the way to learn Ukrainian for me would not be to study the dictionary and, and, and debate the words and whatever of the dictionary. It would be going out there, speak to people, talk to people, practice, uh, study. Uh, but in the end, the best way would be to go out in Kiev, out in the streets and talk to people and maybe even live in Kiev. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen, but just the idea, learning something is by doing it. I wanted to give people some, some uh, view on Scrum as a framework that was more holistic than is described in the Scrum that anyhow um, describes some additional things. And, and hopefully get people over their obsession with uh, reading and interpreting the Scrum Guide. So in that initial paper in 2020, I described the what I call the six essential traits of the game. As Scrum, it's like playing a game, go out and learn to play the game. And, and six traits, six sort of characteristics that I, that, I, that I would keep in mind to see, is the game, play, is the game being played correctly? And, and those six traits were, I don't want to go into them uh, too deeply, is the simplicity of Scrum. Uh, Scrum is a simple framework, yet it is sufficient to help us 
manage our product development completely start to end uh, start to finish end to end whatever you want to call uh, scrum's dna very important for me scrum's dna consists you know dna a string of of uh, uh, a connected uh, string of two two uh, chords actually um, it's what i call self organization and empiricism that is scrum's dna that is underlying the framework of scrum uh, the ambition of scrum to be uh, that the players the people involved demonstrate accountability um, proactively, almost spontaneously, show that they are accountable people. That they can, you don't have to hold them to account. So, simplicity, Scrum's DNA, self organization, empiricism, uh, accountability, and then uh, value again, a flow of value. I will go deeper into that today. Uh, provide transparency over the value that you are delivering, that you are not delivering, how you're trying to deliver that. Closing the loops, it's all about feedback loops. That reminds me of that 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 first quote of of Jim Highsmith that I'm afraid that is still happening that uh, project managers are being schooled, teached, edu taught, educated into serial uh, long face thinking. The ambition of Scrum was to get over that by um, working on feedback loops, closing feedback loops regularly, frequently, so that you don't end up in a black box of of a, of a, of a uh, periods that are way too long and then the scrum values so next to scrum's dna the scrum principles underlying scrum self-organization in business scrum tries on five values so i wrote that paper back in 2020 and then in the meantime i was talking at events going out to people working with organizations still doing classes that because that sort of restarted uh after a while after corona was sort of uh Push more into the background, or at least we all went for an online way of working. Remember that remotely and so on. And, and then I realized, oh no, my God, sort of what this lady is having, the, the, the idea, there must be more to moving Scrum downfield, right? It can't just be helping people get across their obsession with the Scrum Guide, helping people acquire a more holistic perspective on Scrum. There is more and there must be more. And then... Over that time, so from 2020 until now, I was reminded of other work that I had been doing in 2017 already. In 2017, I tried to artic articulate an alternative approach to what people were calling agile transformations by then. So a lot of companies were going through whatever they would call an agile transformation. It was hardly successful. I haven't seen too many successful transformations, to be honest, um, if not to say not a single one. Uh, because they were pro they were approached, they were built on the 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 uh, old school principles like the industrial approach, cookbook um, approaches, um, sort of large scale things, industrialized things, and so on. That didn't work. So in 2017, I tried to articulate something that I called reversify to reversify, and for me, it starts already with the word because to reversify is an, is a verb. It's something that you need to do. So it's an act. It's not something that you can copy paste from other people. And, and reverse fire itself is an old English word. That means to formulate or reformulate something anew in verse. So turn something, an existing text into a verse again, something of poetry, something of a more prosaic thing. And that, that appealed to me a lot because the idea my idea is to help organizations transform to uh, a more harmonic organization, restore the, the people aspect of it, that what I call humanizing the workplace. That is for me so important. And to reversify an organization requires two steps for me. So two, two sort of connected loops. The first is to reimagine Scrum. A lot of those organizations, Organizations, also the one caught up in 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 a uh, deadlock, <laughs> agile transformations, are, are stuck. They have introduced Scrum, and and they're wondering where are the results now. When I go in there and look at them at how they've organized their Scrum, there's a lot of room for improvement, to say it uh, gently. But then the most important part is to rethink the organization around Scrum. Introducing Scrum, keeping it to the teams itself is impossible. It's it's even um, counterproductive 
you have to rethink the structures, the things around Scrum. And that is that is not even touched upon in the Scrum Guide, uh, rightly, I believe, because we can't touch upon all those things. Um, I think we hoped that we could help people organize their Scrum and then detect and then use inspection adaptation to rethink the organization around it. How do you work with people? How does HR work? How do you work with budgeting? How do you work with governance, procedures, processes around things? How do you... Uh, guarantee uphold quality um hr types of things the hiring processes the 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 review processes and so on but unfortunately that didn't really happy happen but that is in the end to reverse fire is what i would now call um to move your scrum downfield yeah and and uh to reverse fire an organization let's let's quickly go through those steps and maybe they will resonate with you reimagine your scrum meaning rethink how you do scrum but you know what do it one product at a time one service whatever in potentially in your terminology one project at a time i don't care my, my terminology would be one product at a time so not for all teams over a short limited time span that doesn't help. That is the industrial approach. Make it unique. Make it context specific. And reimagining your Scrum starts by knowing your product. What is your product that you're using Scrum? And because we've got a product owner in Scrum. We've got a product backlog in Scrum. Um, in my paper, I already called it like that. And it's, it's later on also added to the Scrum Guide. Product is what we call the vehicle of value. It's, it's the way you deliver value to... Uh, to the market, to users, to the organization, and so on. I'll be talking about that. So by, by identifying, clearly identifying your product, then reset, read your boot, reboot your Scrum to optimally serve that product. Organize, reorganize your Scrum teams so that they can optimally serve the product by uh, limiting dependencies, eliminating dependencies, having a real product owner, somebody who really owns the product by having a real product backlog, a backlog for the product, and then facilitate your teams, help your teams um, grow, improve um, in terms of people, relationships within the team, within uh, towards the organization, those in terms of technical infrastructure, tools, authorizations, and so on, facilitate them so that they can start releasing what I call tasty sashimi product slices regularly, yeah? frequently, call it in feedback loops. And the second part of that is to re-emerge the structures around Scrum. Now, as a lot of organizations over the past 20, 25 years of Scrum have been adopting Scrum, um, there are not a lot of them, and personally, I don't know any of them, that has had the courage to rethink how they work around Scrum in all those areas that I talked about. HR processes, governance, procedures, quality, releasing, and so on. So, so re-emerging the structures around Scrum should serve to help you to optimize how you work, to optimize for value, not for completion, not for perfection, not for um, big band types of releases, no, to optimize for value. And that is what I would call nowadays moving your Scrum downfield. So this is the bigger picture, the bigger picture that lady, and actually I also I was looking for at some point of time. But what I want to talk about today is one specific thing. As part of the, the second big feedback loop, re-emergent structures around Scrum, it starts by what I call arming or to arm for value. So think about value, basically. So, so imagine you've reimagined your Scrum, you've reorganized your Scrum, you've uh, reset um, your Scrum, you've optimized your teams, uh, your delivery, your... Um, infrastructure, your authorizations, the tools that you use, you've optimized them to be able to produce sashimi product, tasty sashimi product slices, sprint after sprint after sprint. And as you know, that is the idea of Scrum. Organize all work in those short cycles that we call sprints with the, um, the, the um, ideal to be able to produce a releasable version of your product no later than by the end of a sprint, which means no later than, than by the end of every cycle of four weeks. Yeah, And then um, maybe a next step would be to arm for value. And, and why is that important for me? 
because I don't know, a, a long time ago from 2013 until 2016, um, I, I worked, I partnered with Scrum.org and uh, Ken Schreiber, uh, one of the, the people that is generally um, seen as, as one of the co-creators of Scrum. And we were working together on courseware and assessments and, and you can call them exams if you want. And we were guiding uh, trainers and coaches around the world. And one of the things we noticed is that a lot of companies have no idea why they introduce Scrum. They just do it because everybody else is doing it. They've got no clear idea about why are we doing it. And that is certainly not helpful. In that sense, they're doing Scrum because of Scrum. Um, because they think it's a sort of magical silver bullet that will solve all of their problems. So we wanted to help those people look beyond actually Scrum. In that sense, and that's something I, I, I remember from those days and, and throughout my career, Scrum cannot be the purpose of Scrum. Don't do Scrum because of Scrum. And that is really important. Um, so, so if I can take you a little bit back to some sort of basic thing, a definition of Scrum. And, and uh, you see the definition of Scrum according to the dictionary. You know that Scrum comes from the game of rugby, which is uh, important in the sense that it's about teamwork in the, in the first place. Um, and the, the my personal, whatever you would call it, definition of Scrum is the one you see on, on the, the bottom side of the screen. It's what I call an empirical framework that enables people to derive value from complex challenges. And I hope you will agree with me that certainly software development is a highly complex challenge. It's full of uncertainties. It's full of unpredictabilities. It's full of uh, un unexpected events that ruin, that, that mess up your work. In that sense, that's why following the plan, completion is pointless because your plan will never be perfect, correct. Uh, it's, it's that sort of predictive way of thinking still. So... Um, Empiricism and complexity go together. So I wanted to have those aspects in, in, in my definition of Scrum. So empiricism meaning the regular process of inspecting so that you can adapt. Uh, inspection and adaptation, that is empiricism. It's about people. It's even about, remember that Scrum's DNA, it's about self-organizing people. It's about creating an environment. And that's something that as uh, project managers, PMI people, whatever we want to keep in mind, also, whatever you would call it, as a project manager, your role is to create an environment that helps people deliver uh, whatever they can, do the best they can, and deliver the most that they can. Whether that is according to the plan is, uh, for me, of less relevance. So empiricism. And then uh, the final aspect, the fourth aspect that I want to be in there, it's about deriving value from those complex challenges. How to turn an unpredictable... Um, activity like software development, how to get value from that. And it's done by big bang releases. So value is the purpose of Scrum. But value is a very generic word. So uh, let's dive into that a little bit. But first, I want to emphasize for you, uh, specifically, the starting point of Scrum is product, not project. It's about delivering valuable slices of a product regularly. So product is a starting point. For a product, you could identify, define a project, but product should be the starting point. Product is some sort of stability. And then like Antonio called out, you would like dedicated teams, dedicated product teams, meaning teams that are dedicated to delivering, evolving, changing, updating, potentially even supporting a product. So keep that in mind. Again, product, to give that a definition, uh, um, you can see what the dictionary says, but that's sort of boring and very uh, overly generic in my view. So I wanted to have some sort of definition of product out there, my scrum definition of a product. And a product for me is, it can be tangible, it can be non-tangible, it can be a physical something, it can be a digital something, it can be, in the end, be a service. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it can be a value stream. Yeah? Um, as long as it provides value, and not just value in general, but value to the end consumers, the end users. 
Yeah, it shouldn't be value in the sense that we can give it to a different team. We can send it to the QA department. We can send it to the release department. We can send it to the testing department. That is maybe value within the organization, but it's not value to the consumers, to the end users of the product. So keep that in mind. For me in Scrum, it's only a product if you can, if you use it as a vehicle to deliver value to the consumers of the product, the people that have to consume and use the product. So, so you might want to keep that in mind. And, and this focus on value, is this new? No, absolutely not. This is, uh, you see, a highly pixelated uh, image that I've introduced. It is pixelated. Why? Because I, 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 I screen copied it from a, a very early version of a class that uh, we were uh, releasing. It's called the PSPO class, so Professional Scrum Product Owner class. This is from a beta version of that class, April 2011. Imagine 12 and a half years ago. And already by then we were focusing, we, we were hoping that at least product owners, but in, in the end, everybody involved in Scrum, focusing on value. It's all about value, period. And it's even older than that. I've already referred to that book of Jim Highsmith. Um, and Jim Highsmith was one of the, the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, there were people from 70 people, you know, uh, people from Scrum, people from Extreme Programming, uh, people like Jim Highsmith, uh, Adaptive Software Development and so on. Um, and, and they all agreed over the, the first principle. So we've got the, value, the Agile Manifesto, five, four value statements and 12 principles. And the first principle is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer so not just another department to satisfy the customer to early and continuous delivery of valuable software, not just software, not just products, but valuable software and valuable products, meaning products that have value to those people. So this focus on value is certainly not new, but it seems to be a very difficult one because we are overly focused on volume often. And that is the old way of thinking. That is the industrial way of thinking. Producing more, producing faster, producing quicker, getting it out there on the market uh, more quick. That might be fine, but it's a very limited view. The idea should, in the end, be about value. And now, how to arm for value? As you can see, ARM, I've written it in capitals, meaning trying to uh, get the message across that it's about it's an acronym. So the first step to take is to assume value. Make assumptions about value. Assume that you are going to deliver value. And how do you make those assumptions? By organizing your product backlog for it. The backlog, the list of work that you think is uh, needed, potentially valuable for the product, for uh, releases of the product. So assume value. And, and the, the most straightforward way to make assumptions about value is to, like I said in, in, in my paper, to um, have transparency over a flow of value, meaning your product backlog should make visible, insightful, what is the flow of value that we hope to realize. Yeah? So the ordering of your product backlog should reflect how you think value will be delivered. In the end, you could have a sort of indication, an, an, a parameter, an attribute of value for your product backlog items. I think we all know about estimating product backlog items. People often do it with planning poker, which is a good technique. It's, a, it's an optional, it's not a must in Scrum, it's a good a potential technique uh, using um, uh, um, story points, again, an optional technique, and often story points expressed uh, uh, in units that follow the uh, scale of Fibonacci. It's all fine. So that is good, but it's an estimate of effort. How about connecting some sort of estimate, some sort of expectation of value next to that? So that you not only focus on how much work is involved in realizing a product backlog item, but also uh, what we think in, in terms of uh, valuable or uh, valuable of that item. So organize your product backlog for value, not just blindly pushing feet, trying to push features out onto the market. Now you can assume value, you can organize your product backlog as much as you want. You can, you can 
potentially create uh, uh, releasable increments of your product uh, by the end of the sprint. But in the end, if you're not releasing to the market, you will still be blindfolded. You will still have no idea what is happening. But if you would only release to the market, you would still be blindfolded. If you don't measure, if you don't, what I call closing the loop, if you don't close the feedback loops with your users, with your consumers regularly, repeatedly. So, so how to arm for value, organize your product backup for value, release your increments to the market, to the end users, to the consumers. That means you have created output in the form of increments, but then you want to focus on the outcome of your output, the impact that you're having with your user base. You made an assumption about value, now you want to be able to validate that assumption or be open to potentially see your assumption be invalidated because that might be reality too. Yeah? So uh, that is important. So arm for value, assume value, release, and then measure it. Now, as I said early on, value is a rather genetic word, which is, I think, a good thing because it means we have to think about it. We have to define what value means to us in our context, for our products, our users, our consumers, our organization. So, so a way to think about it, sort of a, a, an entry point to think about and define value is to think about value for whom? Whom are we trying to deliver value to? And as I've repeatedly said, it's always been the ambition to produce value um, as a benefit to the consumers of your product, of your service, so that the people at the end of your value stream so I like to call them consumers. They will be, uh, they should be valued probably for the people sponsoring you, the people allowing to do the work that you do, the people asking you even to do the work that you do to uh, deliver the products and the, and the increments of products that you are delivering, meaning sponsors, often stakeholders, um, representing the organization. So you've got the consumers of the product, you've got the people sponsoring you, asking you to do that, might be stakeholders, might be other representatives of the organization. And the, I think that would be two obvious sort of beneficiaries of value, right? What I think is also really important, there should also be value in adopting Scrum for the people doing the work. I call them the creators because software is not built, it's not produced. Um, it's not engineered, you create it. It's a creative activity full of uncertainties that need to be tackled. So uh, for the Scrum teams, you want to be able to uh, uh, increase value and certainly development teams or developers within the Scrum team. So that is also important. And then I was talking about this a lot over the past couple of years. And then uh, last year I was, I was introducing this at some large bank in the, in the Netherlands. And then afterwards, a lady came up to me, not, not a lady on a picture, by the way, a lady came up to me uh, asking about, hey, Gunther, what about this sort of value? And I was like, oh my God, you're right. It was a lady called Madeleine Pilon. And I said, yeah, you're right. I've been talking about it, but I've never put it sort of front and center. You're right. I should be doing this. That is a special recipient of value. You know, those are the typical things. Although for the teams and the creators, maybe not so typical, but for the consumers, users, obvious. For the people uh, sponsoring you, obvious. For the organization. But what about um, showing our accountability, demonstrating our accountability as a team, as an organization, as a department, whatever, towards society, towards the environment, in the end, towards the planet? What about not just delivering value to the consumers, the sponsors, the creators, what about making sure that we also do something valuable for the planet, that we contribute to a more um, a worthwhile uh, society and even the planet? So and that is, I think, more and more important because I don't know if you know, but as an IT sector, we have a huge impact. Yeah, Sort of our exhaust or our... Um, our footprint that we have on the environment and the planet is 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 comparable to at least an average uh, country. So we're sort of a virtual hidden uh, country somewhere that is producing a lot of exhaust. 
and it's growing. As you know, software, the impact of software is huge. Imagine, imagine taking out the internet for a few days. Imagine that, how, how, how difficult that would be. So software is all over the place. It's in every aspect of our life. So it's, it's, it's very important. So what I did last year when introducing this at that large bank, I connected that lady, she's called Mariana Pilon, with the CEO of Scrum to Talk, who's called Dave West, because I felt it was really important. So they had a talk about it. Um, you can see on the screen, uh, it, the, the result of their talk, their conversation, their interview was uh, was published on the website of Scrum to Talk. It's called Raising Climate Awareness in Scrum Teams. Um, and it was building on an idea that Marilyn has, that I really love, um, some sort of workshop that he has the planet as a stakeholder. It's something that she, she does at uh, retrospectives and a planet checking. So have a look at it, but think about it. Uh, what if we would think about the power consumption of our systems, the number of uh, the number of services it uses, and uh, the number of, of connections it has to build? What if we would design our systems in a way that we're not just building features, but we build features in a way that they sort of reduce the impact that we have on the environment. Now, like I said, arming for value, assume value, or you can also say assign value on your product backlog. In that sense, you anticipate the creation of value. It's A's, it's one A, but you can use three, three uh, sort of uh, words for that. So um, arm for value, meaning assume value, assign value, anticipate value. Um, they have a little bit of different feeling, but they all work for me. Release it, but then measure value. In that sense, the success of Scrum should be in your increased capacity, ability to deliver value. That requires closing the feedback loop. Otherwise, you can't sort of prove, give evidence that you are actually delivering value. Now, if you want to measure that, again, start with those recipients or uh, beneficiaries of value, the consumers of the product. How can you measure that those people are um, getting value, getting a benefit from the work that you do by measuring customer satisfaction, user satisfaction, retention, conversion, visits, usage of your systems, potentially market share, and so on. In most organizations, uh, most organizations that do Scrum are like more commercial organizations. So for the sponsors of, of your work, value is probably going to be represented in something of money. Revenues, profits, benefits, financial benefits, increased sales, but it might also be in the competitive position of, of the company, for instance. So think about that. Value for the creators of the product might be represented in sort of engagement, commitment of the team. Are they really engaging intrinsic motivation? Do you see intrinsic motivation rising? Do you see the buzz, the energy on the work floor rising? Or are you still stuck with lots of turnover, people leaving the team, leaving the organization, leaving the department, wanting to move somewhere else, absenteeism? I don't know how's that over there, but in in in, in Belgium, Netherlands, uh, France, whatever we have it in Europe, we've got a lot of problems with uh, burnouts uh, of people, long term absenteeism, uh, sickness of people, depression of people, and all because we have these toxic workplaces. So introducing Scrum should help you uh, reduce and even even eliminate the 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 toxic toxicity of the workplace. And then a value for the environment. Um, you might think about how to measure that in terms of sustainability, power consumption, carbon efficiency, exhaust of, of things. Uh, and and uh, that might be in network connections. And because, you know, nowadays we all think in terms of the cloud, but I hope do hope that we all realize that it's not really a cloud. You know, it's really hardware somewhere on the planet that is using power, that is using uh, electricity. How can we build systems that use less electricity, build up less connections, require uh, reduce the footprint of our systems and applications and the number of services needed and so on. That will help the planet. Now, to tie it all a little bit together, so arming for value, assigning value, arming for value, releasing, measuring, and some potential indicators, which is for me important is uh, another aspect of Scrum, introducing Scrum. It should help you deliver more value. 
Yeah, not just deliver more, but more value. So moving from outcome, output, sorry, to outcome, moving from your increments towards measuring the impact you have with your increments. That is actual value, meaning value for your consumers, your stakeholders, for the teams, for the creators of the of of, of uh, the product, and for society and even uh, for the planet. Measurements that you might want to have in place that will help you uh, measure, get a feeling, an indication over are we actually delivering value, meaning actual value? Is this actually valuable, the work that we do? It's like I said, in terms like customer satisfaction, market share, potential financial returns, engagement of the team, uh, absenteeism, and so on, power consumption, all those things will help you that. Yeah. So, so you have to think about that. How to capture those um, those uh, uh, measurements, those uh, metrics? How to use them as indicators? Because you might, with a release of an increment, you might think that you're going to increase customer satisfaction. It might not be happening. That is very valuable information. Why is that not happening? What was wrong in my assumption? What can I do differently on my future product backlog work to turn that around? And 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 uh, should it mean tweaking the systems and so on? You're, we're hoping to get more market share. We're hoping to get more financial profits and so on. It's not happening or it is happening. You have to capture that. It's about indicators that you should, you should embrace full transparency over the, the those indicators. So they are not targets, they are not objectives. Those are things that you measure that give you an indication of your ability to actually deliver value. Now, introducing Scrum should not only help you increase, optimize, maximize your ability to deliver value, it should also help you to discover new value to innovate, to do new stuff, not just tweak things. So that is also important. What might be new value that we can offer to the market, to users, to new users? How can you attract new consumers, new users maybe? Is it with new features, is it with new products even, with new services? Very important, how we can deliver value in that way for the organization, again, for the teams. So, so introducing Scrum should not just help you do more faster, but should help you do the right things. And not just the right things currently or actually, but also discover new things. And, and potential indicators that will have give you an indication, are we actually able to deliver new value? Is, is a couple of things that I call feature uh, usage. How much of our systems is actually, uh, systems are actually being used? So if half of your features are never being used or hardly being used, which is sort of way, sort of the, what the what what research says, how about getting rid of them? How about potentially updating or tweaking them? But what about just getting rid of them? It will be, by the way, it will be good for the planet to remove that code from your systems. Yeah. So what is the actual usage of your systems? Um, that means uh, an indication, oh, well, maybe people don't see a lot of uh, value in, in, in our systems. How about it connecting it to what I call the feature turnover rate? Um, how much of your current um, features, the, the features that you are currently offering, how much of those features are actually new features, features that you have built over, let's say, the past year, the past two years, the past three years? Or are you just concerned? Are you just... Um, busy updating existing things, tweaking them, adding them a little bit, not building really new innovative features. And the same at the level of the product. How much new, how many new products have you actually built over the past couple of years, rather than just tweaking, updating existing products? And and how much, uh, how many products have you actually taken out, taken out of the market because they don't deliver value things indicators that are you also looking for new value and not just trying to update sort of old value and the role of an agile way of working of um, an agile approach to your software development or your uh, 
tackling any any type of complex challenges via Scrum is to increase your agility. And your agility should sustain that ability to deliver value, but also that ability to find and discover new value. So, and, and that's a reflection also of that first principle of the HR manifesto. It's a reflection of what, what is in the defi my definition of Scrum, but not just in mine, it's also in a, in a similar way in the official definition of Scrum in the Scrum Guide. It's about value. Scrum cannot be the purpose of Scrum. Value is the purpose of Scrum. And value is something very different than volume so be driven by delivering value not just sorry volume volume has this idea of utilization calling people resources which is very disrespectful people are people human beings not resources think about human resources humans are not resources resources in our world might be computers um, equipment tools infrastructure whatever but not people. So think about agility, your ability to deliver value, your ability to discover new value. And indicators of your um, ability to do that might be that dead code index that I talked about. How much code of your uh, system is never being used, never being addressed, never being uh, uh, spoken to? Get it out. It will also be good for the planet again. What is your release? cadence how often do you go to the market what is your ability to actually go to the market um, how done are your increments by the end of the sprint how releasable are there in that sense how much time do you still have to spend on work that is actually undone it's not really done we fool ourselves in thinking it was done and then reflect that back to how you do scrum how long does it take us to go to the market how much distractions do we have within a sprint? Um, how often are we forced to not focus on the work that we are doing in this sprint, the forecast, the selection of product backlog items in this sprint, meaning getting tracked to boring meetings where, you, where, the, where you don't want to be, having to spread myself over three teams at the same time. That all reduces my focus, so that unfocused time, in a way, things that will... Um, that will lead to a reduction of your agility. But again, like I said, these are samples. Think about it for yourself. What does value mean for you, your organization, your users, your consumers? And how can you show that you have successfully introduced Scrum by measuring that outcome, the increased value with your users, new users, new products, and so on? To think about it. these are just suggestions, but at least it's more than just doing Scrum because of Scrum. Are we now following the process perfectly? Yes, that might be happening, but you might still not have the six essential traits of the game being exposed. You might just be following the process. You might not be um, applying empiricism, self-organization, enacting the Scrum values. You might still not be closing loops regularly enough. And these are just the general warnings that I've already included about measurements. They are not targets. You want to do this repeatedly so that you have trend lines uh, that will show you a trend over time and not just look beyond sort of singular data points or uh, singular data sets. Um, you might have need more indicators like we just shown value for consumers, value for the organization, value for your uh, creators, value for society and, and even the planet. So, so how to balance them out? The one should not go at the cost of the other one. To give you an example, what is the point of delivering a lot of value with your users if uh, your company doesn't have any benefits from it? Or even worse, what is the value of having uh, really happy users happy sponsors, a happy organization, but your people keep uh, being, uh, uh, you keep burning out your people and they still want to leave. And then again, uh, you can expand that to value to the to society and the planet here. And think about that product life cycle. Products have a life cycle. 
That means it should be natural at some point of time to take them out of the market. At some point of time, you think about it, you conceive them, you think about feasibility, you think about markets, market research, and so on. You start building and creating them. Um, so over the lifetime of your product, probably your definition of value is likely to evolve. So don't think in terms of rigidness, think in terms of agility. But it starts by knowing your product. What is your product? What is your vehicle to deliver value? Without it, you won't reboot your teams. You won't optimize even your teams for value. It's going to be very difficult to arm for value. So I hope you liked it. This was my sort of main message, how to arm for value. There's another acronym that I have, and I just quickly want to throw it out. I'm not going to dive into that. But you want to think about the following thing, how to turn your organization, your team, your system into an armada of value. Not just arm for value, but based upon those measurements, closing the feedback loop, adapt for value. And that are those are the, the, the additional aspects of to move your scrum downfield. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I have no idea about timing. I know that I'm well beyond in, within my time of 45 minutes, which I can assure you is a miracle in itself. I never do that. So thank you very much. I know, um, Anastasia, is there room for questions? Should we go to some yes. questions? Have you identified some? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much for presentation, first of all. Yes, we have a couple of questions, so maybe let's start with them. Uh, first question, yeah, could you please explain once again about uh, feature product turnover rates? Yeah, so so the idea is um, to, to uh, build up an indication for yourself on the sort of turnover of features within your product. That means how many new features have you built over the past year, past two years, uh, versus how many features have been in there for a very, very long time. And are they actually being used? So that's sort of um, the idea of, of some sort of um, dynamics within your product. How many new features have you built versus how many old features are still in there and have been in there for a very long time? And are they actually being used? So feature usage and turnover are in that sense connected. Does it help? I hope so. For me, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good uh, start. Thank you for answer. Um, yeah, next was which ways uh, would you suggest for backlog prioritization and uh, yeah, who should be involved? Except yeah. people. Yeah, so so what we say in Scrum is product backlog should be managed by the product on. We call we say that the product backlog should be ordered in that sense, not just prioritized. I don't know, it, it probably everybody knows about prioritization, things like Moscow must have, should have, and so on, or high, medium, low, one, two, three, whatever you would call them. We want to take a step further, meaning your product backlog should be ordered. That means there should be a clear sequence. This is product backlog item one. This is the second, this is the third, and so on. So that ordering should be done by the product owner. That product owner, in, in, in our view, should be driven by a vision for the product. What is important to do for the product uh, in terms of the existence of the product, the connection of the product to company strategies, company hopes, and company ambitions, and so on. So, so ordering the product backlog should be driven by a perspective of value. In that sense also, oh, what are users looking for most urgently? We say product backlog also a living artifact. That means at every single point in time, it should be actual. That means now we can think about the product backlog for the next three months, but based upon every sprint, we should be able to change, update, and, and uh, um, um, extend or minimize or whatever the product backlog. So it's not a fixed plan. Yeah? So it should be updated regularly based upon findings of what is more important now, what might be more important in the future. But that's all driven by value. What is most important to do now? Not just about, yeah, once upon a time, we promised that we would deliver this, yeah, but if it is not actual today, don't do it. So, so that's a very dynamic thing. 
So ordering your product backlog should be done from a perspective of value so that as a product owner, when you get questions about, yeah, why is my stuff so low on the product backlog that you can explain, yeah, you know what? We've done user research. We've been connected to users. It's not important for the company right now. So it's all about value. And a product owner should be driven by value and order the product backlog for value. And then sprint after sprint, you, you, you pull work from that product backlog into the sprint and you turn it into hopefully a releasable version of that product. And then you bring it out. So organize your product. Don't see your, <laughs> I know a lot of PMI people, don't see your product backlog as the new word for the old school project plan. It's more dynamic, it's more living, and it should be driven by value and not just on, I don't know, upfront agreements over uh, what we should do by what point of time. But also it probably should be balanced um, according to the time of, for implementation, right? In case something brings a big value, but uh, takes uh, a year to implement, probably it will yep. not be at the top of the backlog list. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of things in that. That's also why I said it might be useful on a product backlog guide to not just an indication of the work involved, but also an indication of, of the potential value or the assumed value it would bring so that the product owner can, like you said, Anastasia, balance those things out. How much work versus how much uh, value? And then organize the product backlog to be able to deliver as much value as possible for at least effort in a way because that's sort of about return on investment. Um, and then the other thing that you talked about, if you have work that is like really big and a lot of work involved, the challenge is, but it's always possible, I've never been in a situation where that was not possible, to slice up that big chunk of work in small things that you can deliver in a sprint anyhow, might be connected to your definition of value. The definition of value in, in a way of, of looking at value might also, a minimal way of value might be in learning. In that sense, if work goes across multiple sprints, you still want to slice it into things that you can do in one sprint, even if you would not release the learning by producing it, by creating it, by at least by the end sprint connecting with stakeholders over it. There might be a lot of lessons into that. So, so don't, don't turn the work in a long black box that goes across multiple sprints. Have that transparency, even if you can't release it. Yeah. Yeah, super. Agree. Thank you so much. Um, next question was approaches to define product goal. It's more yeah, the, management question, but still. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, I, 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 in a way, Anastasia, I'm glad and sad that you connected to a project management uh, familiar thing, because I think, I don't know if, if people are aware of that in the latest Scrum Guide, Product goal was added to Scrum. In that sense, the Scrum guide itself became uh, lightweight, more lightweight, small, more simpler in that sense. But in that sense, uh, Scrum itself became heavier in a way because they added something to it, which is the first time ever, I believe. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. Just because of what you said, Anastasia, product goal brings back this almost old, potentially, not necessarily, old notion of of, 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 of a concept of a project. That is not the idea, obviously. Product goal is something you want to achieve for a product that spans or that goes across several sprints. The most simple, because it always starts with product. So product goal is something within the product backlog. In that sense, it's not a new artifact. What they try to achieve is to help people think in terms of what is the next sort of big goal we want to achieve with our product. That might be a large capability. That might be that, that bigger chunk of work that you talked about, Anastasia, as an example. That might be a next release. That might be building a big capability. That might be a workflow, whatever. But it should give focus, direction to all the work, all the work that is high on the product back. So the, the, the ideal ID by having that is have a product goal and then all the work that you're going to focus on with your product back for the next sprints or next couple of sprints is product backlog guidance that will help achieve that goal. Yeah. Um, now, what is important for me about goals is you might along the way by arming for value and measuring uh, the, the outcome of your work, you might find out that your goal becomes obsolete then it's a very sensible thing 
to reset goals. So for me, goals are not about what it is described in the Scrum Guide commitment, although in a way it is, but it's more about focus, direction, making sure that the whole team is working in the same direction. That is for me a goal, some sort of dot, not too far on the horizon that everybody is working towards so that it creates focus. That means it eliminates all the work that is not contributing to achieving that goal. But goals are easily transformed into targets and objectives and must achieve and so on. Where for me it's about direction and focus. But it's uh, it's 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 it is a way to help people, stakeholders also, but also teams and product owners look across sprints. Because I I do feel the pain that they are trying to address, because in a lot of organizations we're now doing scrum. And that means we've got all these little isolated cycles of work, but we call sprints. And it's trying to potentially connect sprints uh, uh, together in a way. So think about something, a state of the product that you're aiming for. And then uh, um, when you will achieve that in the sense of a timeline or hopefully not co uh, converting that into a deadline, uh, that, that, that will come from experience by building those, implementing those product backlog items. And then you can start building up a forecast on your product backlog, on your product goal, based on actual experience, sprint after sprint, how much work have we done? What is changing? How much work do we still need to do? You can build up some sort of projection in time um, and, and, and create some ID. Because in the end, if product backlog is ordered, meaning there's a clear sequence, that means there is a timeline going through that. Because this is item one, this is item two, and so on. So in a way, you can use that to build up some projects as well time, knowing that it can and it probably will change. So always be careful about uh, hard-coded promises of uh, of time. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Um, yeah, one more. Uh, so what are your recommendations for not mature enough teams? Because we have this prerequisite that for Scrum, yeah, we need a um, mature team, a self-organized team who can drive, who can take collective responsibility, but it's not always the case. Uh, yeah, so, so sometimes we have uh, more juniors in the team and how Scrum Master may help. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, let me start by saying something that I do not intend as an insult to the person asking that question. That is a waterfall question. What should we do? What should we have in place? How mature should people be? What should be happening in the organization before we can start with Scrum? There's only way, one way to start with Scrum. Do it. Act. Go out. Play the game. Learn, evolve, and so on. I'm uh, not a fan of all this maturity thinking at all. My my experience, my belief, but also my experience that every single human being can self-organize. We all do that. In our private life, we all do that all the time without a boss looking over us, breathing down our neck and so on. So every single human being is capable of self-organizing. What is limiting the benefits you get from Scrum in terms of self-organization is all, almost the organization impeding, blocking self-organization. So the role of the Scrum Master should be to clear the way for people, every human being, to, um, to, to uh, practice, to show that they are responsible, accountable, self-organizing persons. So don't think in maturity of the team, thinking what is preventing the team from really self-organizing, gelling, working together, figure things out together, solve things out together within the boundaries of Scrum, within the ambition to produce something of value, no later than by the end of the sprint. And will you have mixed teams? Obviously, you will have people new to this, people old to this, whatever. I don't care. Agility and doing Scrum has nothing to do with the age of people. It has to do with their openness, their willingness, their commitment, their belief in each other, um, the team spirit that lives within the team. And, 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 and as those people are kept together, being really dedicated, they will grow, they will get to know each other, they will change, they will, they will become better in that sense. Is that more mature? I don't know. But I don't like this thinking in terms of 
What maturity should a team have before? As a scrum master, I hope you will act upon the belief that every single human being can self-organize, regardless of where they live, where they reside, whether it's Ukraine, Belgium, France, um, I don't know, Asia, the United States, South America, I don't care. Every single human being has this. So what can we do as scrum, scrum masters to open up this, this way of working for people? That is sort of my belief. And by the way, if I would believe in that sort of thinking, um, Belgium should never do Scrum because we all hide behind hierarchy and layers be above us and so on. And that is, for me, even the biggest problem with Scrum in Belgium right now. So, But that doesn't mean all those people, even Belgian people, intrinsically can self-organize. But they are uh, blocked, locked out from actually using the ability that they have. So go, play, learn, become better, keep the team together, uh, fight bureaucracy, and in that sense, clear the way for the team to really perform. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. And thank you so much for the presentation. I see a lot of thanks in the chat. Please also <laughs> check. And um, yeah, excited to, to have you even at the next uh, yearly conference as well. Okay, wonderful. I, I still hope someday to come back to Kiev. I've been there a couple of times for the Scrum Day Ukraine, organized by my uh, uh, beautiful friend Bogdan Mizur. Um, but he's uh, involved in uh, sort of the, the people's army right now. So um, keep faith, dear people in Ukraine. Keep the courage. Um, there will be a day that I'll be able to come back to a peaceful Kiev. Yeah, you're always welcome, of course, in peaceful one. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.